Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyler Middleton. I'm here at Cloud Next for the second time. So apparently I didn't do too bad last time. That's good to hear. Thanks to Sans for thinking I did well enough to be here this year. Um, this talk is based on a project that consumed my life for about nine months. Uh, it started out sounding really, really simple. Just migrate all the code to somewhere else. How complicated could that possibly be? And it turned out a lot. And uh, we'll go through some of the challenges and solutions that we did here today. Uh, but first of all, let's talk about just the types of consulting work that you'll see. Oh, first of all, the legal team says these are just my opinions, and I'll share a lot of them. So get ready. So number one, I used to consult a lot and you would get pulled into two types of projects and they were entirely not based on the technical challenges. It was entirely cultural. Uh, that's the kind of work that I do at, at my day job. It's an internal consultancy, but it's still coming into stuck projects, stuck things and unsticking them. And the good projects, uh, folks are aware that they didn't have the technical skills or the focus or the time or whatever to get the project done. And they were just absolutely thrilled that you were there. Like, you're the hero. Come solve the problem. This is great. These projects are much easier because of culture. Uh, and then type two is really, really hard projects where uh, they just want stuff to stay the same. And so you coming in is, is kind of threatening, right? Like you're going to knock over their kingdom, their castle that they have built and replace them with, uh, you know, a shell script, like the, the terribly toxic uh, attitudes that some techie folks have for replacing folks. And they, these can be really, really hard to overcome. And thankfully, this is not one of those projects. This was one of the number one projects where uh, folks just didn't have enough time and focus. Uh, there is not a lot of driver to move from uh, an internal to an external uh, source code repository. So I'll talk about why we did it, uh, but it's sure easy to put off, right? Like any of these big transformational enterprisey projects are sure easy to delay. So let's talk about why we did that. Uh, so first of all, just don't break stuff, right? Um, or this is you updating your resume. So, and this is especially challenging for projects like this where absolutely everything talks to your source code. All of your CI CD is all of your automation. And as you'll come to find out, probably dozens or hundreds or thousands of scripts that your developers have written that rely on the features of your uh, internal CI or your external CI or any of the release processes that make your code deploy to somewhere. All of them talk to where your code is stored at. And you will end up breaking a lot of stuff. So uh, this rule, don't break stuff, is impossible for large projects. You kind of just have to foresee all that you can and, and do your best to not break it and set it on fire. And we'll see how well I did throughout this. So first of all, let's move the cheese. Uh, the project is just to deprecate a single Bitbucket server, which is super easy, right? Like it's one server. Thank you, Ron Burgundy, for uh, leading us into the, the next step here. It's one server, but it's 1,500 repositories across 86 Bitbucket projects that are executed by 1,300 Jenkins jobs across two clusters served by dozens of builders. So that's the technical ask. There are so many variables here to try and compensate for and not do a, gen a uh, resume generating event. So we'll do our best. And that's just the technical ask. The business ask is make sure that all 110 engineers that are concurrently working on this code, boy, code base and troubleshooting issues and actually, you know, generating all the money that pays my salary can continue to work and not get in their way. Because if you become the enemies of development, you become the enemy of the business pretty quickly. So we'll do our best to stay out of their way. Uh, so it's the um, keep the plane flying while we're doing surgery on it. The uh, All of those metaphors are certainly in play. Uh, this project had been assigned for two years when I came on board. Um, several small things had been solved, but it uh, was kind of lacking a sort of narrative and impetus to sort of get moving. So let's do it. Why does it matter where the code is stored? Like, who cares? You know, like, why would we even 
tackle this when there's so much risk and so much complexity and it's so much time and expense, like why, why even matter? Like just leave it alone. Um, which is a really great question to start understanding the scope of the project. So where the code is stored matters because of what's integrated with your code storage, which is, as we talked about, absolutely everything. So within code storage, pull requests build and validate the code that you built won't cause issues when release. Uh, when you merge your code, it should deploy and it shouldn't break anything when it does so. And if it does, you need to be able to revert and deploy quickly in all sorts of edge case ways that only developers and DevOps kind of understand because it is Byzantine and complicated and hidden from most people. Um, when code is merged to a release branch, it should be deployed. And what that means is absolutely different for every application I have ever worked with. Uh, does it deploy, deploy right to prod? Sometimes. Does it deploy to a pre-prod smoke testing environment? Sometimes. Is there manual approvals? I don't know, sometimes. And it's all different for all different applications. So we could and needed to go through and find every application that was stored in this code base and sort of process and track and figure out how they were released because all of that stuff is relevant for the automation that I'm going to break and need to rebuild in the new place. So let's break it down. One more prelude before I get into issues that we solved. So The Martian is one of my favorite movies. Uh, down on the bottom right, you can see my advice here, like stop listening to this talk and go watch The Martian because it's so much better than everything that I'm going to say here today. But um, at some point, everything is going to go south and you're going to say like, this is it. This is, this is how I end. Now you either accept that or you get to work. And that's all it is. You begin, you do the math, you solve a problem and you solve the next and the next. And if you solve enough, you get to go home. And uh, I'm certainly not going to get stuck on Mars or in the desert or anything like that. But these projects are so large, so extensive that there's no way for you to hold it all in your head. Even if you are uh, a genius and have had a lot of Red Bull that day. It's just too far beyond the scope of most people to be able to hold into your brain. So you start to break these projects down and that's simply the only way that you can uh, solve it. So you micro uh, segment your project and you start solving problems. So let's talk about problem number one. So problem number one, GitHub pull request should build and validate in our on-prem Jenkins. Now, like why would we do that? GitHub has its own automation called GitHub Actions that could do absolutely everything. Um, however, in this particular business, absolutely everything is a ton of custom PowerShell scripts that have been written over the past 20 years to promote certain functions within Jenkins. All of that, when I started to break it down and try to map it over to GitHub, just scared the bejesus out of me to like go through thousands and thousands of lines of PowerShell across hundreds of scripts and try to figure out how does every application, you know what, let's just not do that. Let's just see if we can figure out how to talk directly to Jenkins. And problem number one, we can't because the code is in GitHub. So when we do a pull request in GitHub, that's on the internet. And our Jenkins server, which is seven years old at the time of doing this project is incredibly vulnerable to absolutely everything because it's seven years old and we could update it. But again, I'm scared of it because it's really old. So we ended up we had this idea where we would have a webhook that would talk to it. Uh, GitHub has the concept of webhooks and GitHub apps and all sorts of stuff that can do like custom HTTP payloads and it would trigger something and we would validate the signature and something like that. And one of our senior DevOps engineers on the SRE team was like, what if you just put a builder on the inside and like just have it talk to Jenkins? And immediately we were like, that sounds way simpler. Let's do that. So we put uh, a fleet of tiny little Docker builders, uh, Linux builders on the inside of our network and registered them to GitHub. Uh, the, the traffic direction is actually uh, egressing our internal environment to go to GitHub to register. So I didn't have to put anything on the internet, which makes me feel a lot better, sleep a heck of a lot better. And for a lot of these tools that solve problems that we're going to talk about for the rest of this talk, we use this pool of builders that are just these little builders, little um, Linux hosts that run bash and JQ and YQ and said, and they're going to run all of the curl commands um, that I'll ever need to talk to Jenkins and do stuff. So first of all, we need to tell Jenkins that something happened, right? Like 
um, Jenkins has this interesting pull model instead of a push model. So in a lot of um, CICDs uh, like GitHub, if you're used to that, or Azure DevOps or TFS, when you do something like you push a commit to your pull request, it notifies the build system and the build system executes that commit. Jenkins doesn't work like that, which made me pull my hair out for a little while. Um, Jenkins is a pull model. So the way that this works is when you do something in your, your CI where your code is stored, it nudges Jenkins and Jenkins does a pull. It um, grabs all of the changes from your source and then it executes every commit one time, uh, which caused a ton of issues when I was trying to map, when I was trying to marry together GitHub and Jenkins' conceptions of commits. I'll talk more about that because it gets really into the weeds, but it caused a ton of issues and I did my best to marry the two, but because they're just fundamentally different understandings of how to execute code, it only kind of works. It only kind of does its best. But anyway, we'll talk about that more a lot. So, um, when that nudge, that elbow nudge that says, hey, Jenkins, something happened is called a commit notify. So I wrote a GitHub action that runs on our internal builders that notifies Jenkins, hey, something happened in this source repo. Um, and you'll see down in the bottom right on almost all of these tool pages, these, these tool slides, there is a marketplace and a source link in the bottom right. I'll, I'll put a link to this uh, PowerPoint presentation in the Slack afterwards. Almost every tool I wrote is open source and many of them are in the marketplace where you can just directly access them as a GitHub action. So hopefully that will make your life a little easier than mine was when I had to write these for the first time. Uh, tool number two. So, hey Jenkins, did that commit build? So you have a pull request in GitHub and you push a commit to your pull request and GitHub has to test it, right? Like GitHub has to tell you, did that commit work? Did the build that is linked to this commit that you just pushed work? Did it build correctly? And that's really hard to tell because GitHub needs to pull Jenkins to figure out whether it worked. And that's challenging. That took a lot more time than any of the other tools that I'm going to talk about today. So Jenkins asynchronously builds the commits because that action is present and says, hey, Jenkins, nudge, nudge, something happened. Jenkins checks into GitHub and finds your commit on your branch and builds it. And maybe it fails and maybe it, su it succeeds. And I needed a secondary action that would also execute within the context of a pull request. And it would pull Jenkins every couple of seconds and say, hey, Jenkins, are you done yet? And when it is finally finished, it would surface the uh, exit code of the Jenkins build for the same commit. Uh, and I have a slide on that because the commit is actually obfuscated when you run a GitHub action. It's interesting. Uh, but if it succeeded, if it was a happy little Jenkins job, you would exit zero and GitHub would see a happy little validation in your pull request. And if it did not exit zero, if Jenkins failed to build your code, maybe your code has an issue somewhere, uh, then it would exit a uh, one and it wouldn't work. And again, these are in the marketplace. Also the source is published. So feel free to go check it. I've already had some um, public commits from the community. I love to open source absolutely everything that I built. So I did. Interestingly, uh, to compare with Jenkins commit, because it, it again builds every single commit, I need to check the exact commit that I am validating in my pull request against what Jenkins is building. So I wrote the code and as far as I could tell, it was absolutely perfect, go me, uh, and it didn't work. And that's because there is an environmental variable in your GitHub action when it executes that says, uh, commit. And it's the commit that is driving this build and it's wrong. And I don't understand why it's wrong. I haven't pursued this. Um, it's probably a bug, but what I ended up doing is just getting the second one. So I look at the entire commit tree. I actually have to clone the Git tree and I get the second one because GitHub has shimmed in like 
new commit for no reason. And then we check that one against what Jenkins has built and those ones do match. So anyway, gremlins and computers, I've never figured this one out, but that works. So who cares? Problem number two, compliance says do it. So there are very few business units that you're going to interface with that says, hey, do this work. And you just have to do it. Like you can't argue with them. And I know some of the folks, some of the seniors are like, well, you you can. And yeah, you probably could push back. But one of the rules for, uh, we're, in, we're in the healthcare space, uh, was to validate that every commit that was pushed to our product is linked to a proper authorization chain in our ticketing system, which is very boring and process heavy and programmatic. Um, but we have to do it. Compliance said do it. So try to figure it out. So our Bitbucket server had something called a pre-commit hook that worked very well for this. When you pushed an invalid commit that didn't start with a, a JIRA or a, you know, a ticket number, it would give you an error and it would even soften it with the teddy bears on screen so that you would feel good and warm and fuzzy even though it rejected you and said, I, I can't accept your commits. Um, GitHub doesn't have the same type of pre-commit hook and there's a little asterisk there. If you're using GitHub on-prem, GitHub does make an on-prem server, they have pre-commit hooks, uh, which would be great, but we're on the internet. So I talked to our TAM uh, from GitHub and said, you know, why can we not do pre-commit hooks? Can you turn them on just for us? You know, like just flip that switch, please. And they said, if they would, because it's uh, limited authorization by the time that executes, they would be DDoSed off the internet. And so I didn't push too hard on GitHub to get them to do that. Instead, I wrote a tool. Uh, feed the yak, referencing our old Bitbucket tool, which is yet another commit checker, which was the pre-commit hook uh, application that worked so very well. Uh, I had to write a post-commit checker, which is a pretty annoying piece of software. Unfortunately, I'm trying to figure out how to soften it. Um, but number one, you uh, do some commits on your computer and you push them to GitHub in a branch, hopefully. And the PR check action extracts, um, it looks at all of your commits from when your branch was branched from the target branch. I said branch too many times, and it creates a list of commits because um, maybe you have one and maybe you have a hundred commits on this uh, PR branch where you're building stuff. And it goes through every single one and it checks to see whether your JIRA ticket is real. And I don't do any further validations like, is this JIRA ticket related to this project? Is it named correctly? I don't care. I just care that there is a real JIRA ticket because then these commits when merged will have a JIRA ticket. And I assume good faith from our author, our authors that it's going to work. Uh, this is also uh, published in, in Medium and in the Marketplace and GitHub. And uh, there's a whole bunch of built-in GitHub actions that are actually commits like uh, reversions and merging and stuff like that. And there's a whitelist for all of those, a permit list. And beyond that, you can just tell it where is your JIRA? What is your JIRA token? And it will go through and check all your commits. So if you want to do the same kind of thing in your organization, you absolutely can. And now it's really easy because the tool is available. Problem number three, uh, repos are islands. And that wasn't the case in Bitbucket. In Bitbucket, they're in cute little folders called projects. And you can set server-wide defaults. You can set project-wide defaults. You can set repo-wide settings. All of that stuff is incredibly hierarchical. Um, TFS, I understand, um, has a similar methodology where you can set sort of... Um, defaults and settings that propagate to all your repos. GitHub doesn't. Uh, each repo is managed individually, which is incredibly annoying. And I put it in yellow, so it would shout in your face a little bit. Uh, repos are managed one by one. Uh, I know GitHub is working on this. So if there's any GitHub folks watching, I'm so sorry that I'm going to slander your name, but I am a little bit because this did annoy me for a, a couple months. Um, so we had 
of course, uh, settings that we want to propagate to all of our repositories. And at this point, there are 1,500 of them. So me clicking into each of them would work, but it would take about a month. Uh, and if we had any changes, I'd have to go fix them individually. And if any of our repositories drifted, because some of our teams have maintain or admin permissions that would allow them to change some of those settings, I would have absolutely no way to check unless I went into every single setting and checked them by hand. So like, clearly this is a problem. This is not something that is enterprise secure or stable or going to work for us. So I wrote a tool. Number three, um, three, a update all of the things. Um, so first of all, all of these earlier tools that we talked about are actions and in GitHub actions are files. Uh, it's not something that you upload a, a setting and you, you upload a file or something like it's literally in the Git tree in a specific branch. Uh, that is your action. So I wrote a, I really didn't want to go into 1500 repos and do 1500 pull requests and then get 1500 approvals. Like there's just too many that that would clearly be a really huge waste of time and just super annoying anyway. So I wrote a script that clones every single repository in the organization and shims in all of my actions and then force merges the pull request into the default branch. I also wrote some logic to add code owner customization. So I, I wrote some classifications for, uh, remember there's 86 projects. So based on that project of where it came from, um, shimming in the correct code owners, which is the sort of required approvers in GitHub land. And then push it and use the GitHub CLI to do a pull request and force merge. And of course, that is a little sketchy from a um, administrative uh, override sort of situation, but it worked very well. And it's all a bash script. It, it runs in Linux and Mac systems uh, and is available in Medium and GitHub. You can push an action, a file, a anything that you want to do across all of your organizations, all of your repos within an organization um to it and it happens actually really quickly it does clone every repository which can be incredibly annoying if some of them are large there's probably a better way uh, but brute force works for for large projects uh number three call the cops so across all of these repos, we have a whole bunch of settings that we want to set and maintain. And so the island nature of repos in a GitHub org shows its head. Even though we have branch policies that should apply to all or almost all repos, we can't configure them at the org level. We have to set them per branch, per repo, every single repo. So early on, we established uh, this problem set, I decided I wasn't going to attempt any part of this manually. So I went through one repository and I wrote all of the REST and GraphQL API commands. GitHub has some very uh, verbose and comprehensive APIs and found a way to update all of the settings that we require. And then I converted it to a GitHub action that would run every night against every repo. And if there were any thing that we needed to modify, I wrote a mutex that for specific repository names or labels or project groupings or whatever, uh, you could have it change some of those settings. So uh, for folks that need to change stuff. And so in this way, we solve a lot of problems. First of all, it is not locking folks down. There are administrators that occasionally need to override your, your best effort settings and merge stuff. And they can, they can change settings. They can bypass whatever they need. This doesn't immediately revert it. This just sets it nightly to be correct. Um, we get all the repo names. We classify the repo based on repo list and the steering list that I, I call a mutex occasionally. And we grant the teams that require access everywhere like DevOps security and ownership teams, the appropriate rights. Um, we set all the branch protections on all of the branches that require them to require that pull requests have passing actions before they're merged. And then we create auto link references. Auto link references create those cute little links from GitHub into your ticketing system. 
And there's 63 that we're maintaining per repo and they are interestingly and annoyingly again, managed per repo. So 63 times 1500 is something on the range of 48,000 GitHub uh, Autolink references that I had to create programmatically, which took a really long time, even with automation. So thank goodness I didn't have to click through all of those. Um, that's also published on my GitHub. It's pretty pretty customized to our use case, but it's certainly something that you could beg, borrow, and steal and go use in your own organization. Um, tool number three, this runs nightly. And when, especially when we were first migrating over, people were creating repositories all the time. And the problem that we faced, of course, is that when you create a repository, it's totally unprotected. There's no settings. And it wouldn't be until that nightly run of the GitHub cop that it would get all of the settings that it needed. And like, that's a really long time to wait and a long time for folks to say, hey, Kyler, something's broken about a hundred times over six weeks. So I decided to make it more automatic. So let's walk through the process here. Number one, Joe Bob, any of your users that have the ability to create a repo does so. Uh, I wrote a GitHub app that notices and sends a webhook to an API gateway that I created in AWS. The API gateway validates the password hash and the message and passes it along to Lambda that I wrote in Python. It extracts the repo name and it triggers the GitHub cop with a name payload. And then number five, the GitHub cop immediately configures and permissions the repo. From the time that someone creates a repository to the time this finishes fully configuring it is it less than a minute. It's it's about 45 seconds, sometimes 60 seconds for the action to kick up, uh, which worked incredibly well. And I haven't had to touch it as, as since I finished this. Uh, we've updated the GitHub cop, of course, many times as we change, you know, we move the field goal of what we need to configure uh, across our repos, but this works great. Uh, it's also a really wonderful model for the future. This is something I haven't built yet, but GitHub Actions can monitor for all sorts of changes across your organization. So if I had someone that was changing some setting that they shouldn't be, like making a single user an administrator of a repo, like you probably shouldn't do that in an enterprise, you should be using Teams. Uh, we could absolutely send a message to this API gateway, which would hit Lambda, which could be configured to post to Slack or something like that. Like it could easily log those to somewhere. So this model works really well. There's a GitHub and two mediums down in the bottom right. Please steal my code. Um, it was a really interesting project and has worked really well and is a cool little gemstone to brag about. 3D. Um, when I had to make 48,000 changes, it turns out that every time you do anything with a GitHub API or with most APIs, they keep track of how much you're bombarding their services with requests. And when I first started this project, I imagined surely I can't run a bash script faster than GitHub. Oh, magical GitHub can keep up with me. Well, it turns out bash is actually kind of fast. Local computing is always going to win. So they keep track of how many tokens you have in your wallet. And every time you make an API request or set or post or whatever, it uses some number of tokens. Things that are lightweight use one. Things that are heavy can use up to like five or 10. Um, and it's actually returned in the header, but I didn't know that when I first started this. So I just configured it to do hundreds of thousands of actions every day, and it would only hit some of them and I couldn't figure out why. And it turns out I would use all of my tokens within about 30 minutes. And then for 30 minutes, all of my API requests would fail. And then my token bucket would get refilled. My token wallet would get filled up. And then all my requests would work for a while. And I was sure that it was just a gremlin in the code, but it turns out it was just tokens running out. So I wrote an API token budgeting function that checks my tokens, which ironically uses one token to check your token bucket. And if we don't have enough tokens to process another repo and run the loop one more time of the 1500 iterations, then it just sits and waits. And every minute it checks to see if the token bucket is refilled. And if not, it waits another minute. This is again, worked really well. It's this code that I haven't had to touch since I wrote it. Um, thank goodness GitHub publishes this API so I can see my token bucket and, and keep up. And there's a medium down on the bottom right with lots of code for you to steal if you're writing any kind of app that maybe configures a lot of stuff uh, against GitHub and makes thousands of calls, 
you are going to hit this issue as well. So absolutely steal the code, please. Tool number three, GitHub Actions allow you to scale out really, really far. So in a matrix build, you can configure 128 builders to run the same action concurrently. And my one builder processing 1500 repositories takes 600 minutes, which is about 10 hours. So what if we scale it to 128 builders? It would take four and a half minutes, right? Like that would be amazing. So I did, and 98% of the calls failed. And that was a bummer um, because I really wanted it to run an army of builders. I really wanted that. So it turns out every single API has secondary API token limits. That's that's GitHub's technical term. And it's just their own way of rate limiting and not getting just absolutely trounced by a single person trying to spam them, which is what they classified me as for quite a while. Um, and I found out that the most that I could scale before I would hit those secondary rate limits that to my knowledge are not configurable or bypassable was two, uh, which is still half the time. It takes five hours each night to run, which is still better than 10, but I'm really disappointed. I couldn't have just an absolute army of builders running. And I could really go on and on and on. And I know I have a little bit today, but I'm gonna try and wrap it up here. So summary, I am still employed. We are fully migrated over to GitHub. I don't think that we broke anything for longer than an hour, which was pretty amazing given the complexity of this stuff. There's lots more to do, like moving all of our builds out of Jenkins and into sort of a more modern-ish building system. And I'm, I'm sorry, I've made enemies of any Jenkins fans out there. Um, but I would love to move everything to GitHub because actions just make so much sense to me. So thank you for listening. I'm around for questions. I think, I don't think I've used up all of my time quite yet. Um, thanks for listening and go build cool stuff.